Hey guys, it's Libby and welcome to a different sort of video from me. So this is going to be my January wrap up. However, I've been having some problems with my fingers lately. I don't know if it's like tendonitis. It started off with just the middle finger on my right hand. So I was like, damn, can't flip the bird for a bit. But now like all of my fingers are feeling kind of strained or something. Um, so I I'm not going to be editing this video. You are going to get raw, unfiltered Libby. You are going to get raw, unfiltered bells whenever they ring. Normally I stop talking and cut them out when the bells chime because they go for like, they can go for 90 seconds, yo. It's really annoying. Um, but yeah, we're just gonna pull through today. Um, so, books that I read in January. Uh, well, I, I, I got real close to finishing another book, let me just briefly um, uh, put my face right next to the camera so I can grab them, uh, explain why I did not quite finish Once Upon a River by Diane Setterfield. So this was the physical book that um, I had been reading for most of January. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the audiobook I was reading in a bit. But um, so I was looking, I was getting to the end of that book and I was thinking ahead to what book I was going to read next. And if you remember, all the way back from last year, I decided to read my books just alphabetically by author, um, which means the next one was going to be the Corfu Trilogy by Gerald Durrell, which is a memoir about when uh, a young Durrell um, and his family decided to move from like cold, rainy England to nice, sunny Corfu. And I was like, you know, Gerald, if I have to stay here in the dark, and cold and wintry mixy North Sea region. I don't want to read about you going to your nice sunny paradise. Uh, I'm going to read a cold book. So I went through all of my shelves and I like pulled out slightly all of the coldest books that I had. And I decided that the one I would read after um, Once Upon a River, uh, read the, 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 once Upon a River, that's the sort of thing I would cut, uh, would be Deathless by Catherine M. Valente. Now, I didn't actually know how cold this was going to be, but um, it's set in Russia, uh, which is, I just think of as a cold place. And this is the, I think this is only the third work I've read set in Russia, not counting the Chekhov plays. Um, so if you count the Chekhov plays, this is the fifth work I've read set in Russia. The first work I read set in Russia was Crime and Punishment, uh, have pity on me, um, which is set in St. Petersburg. And a, a key feature of that book is um, how hot it is. Raskolnikov is like sweating all the time. The heat is making him a slightly insane, um, uh, slightly more insane. And I just read that and I was like, I don't believe you. <laughs> like St. Petersburg is so close to the Arctic Circle. It's, it, it's like one of the furthest north big cities. I do not believe that it is that hot. Um, and you know, maybe it does get that hot, but basically Russia, it's a cold place. Don't try to change my mind. So that's why I picked up Deathless. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna like stick my nose in for a wee bit and then I'll get right back to Once Upon a River. And boy, did that not happen. So right now I'm about 100 pages in to Deathless and uh, I have about 100 pages left in Once Upon a River. So if I had spent those 100 pages reading that other book, then I would have finished it and I'd be able to talk to you about it. But this is why we have February to finish the books we started in January. So, well, I have to check. I read four books in January, um, using red kind of loosely for some of them. Um, so I listened to two audiobooks and I also um, published two of the works that I had been, or two of the projects that I had been working on um, for my work with the online stage. Um, it's a new year, I'll remind people of what that is. Um, I work um, producing, uh, recording lines for and editing uh, full cast audiobooks, which are then, here come the bells, which are then released onto audible.com. We do um, public domain works. And uh, I just finished Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. And as a sort of companion piece, Lover's Vows by Elizabeth Inchbald, because if you've read it or even just heard about it, you know that the um, characters of Mansfield Park at least attempt to put on Lover's Vows. Whew. 
that's a lot of talking. See, normally I would then cut the video, breathe for a bit. This is like an aerobic workout. Okay, so, um, Mansfield Park. You probably already have some inkling of what it's about. Um, so when I discuss it, I'm going to refer to what would be spoilers if you were reading it in 1818, but I think is now just like public consciousness. Like, we know who the end game couple is. It's Fanny and Edmund. Um, so if you don't, if you don't want to hear any more about Mansfield Park, skip to this time. So because I was producing an audiobook for this um, novel and not just reading it, I had a very interesting and uh, perhaps in fact unique experience of it. So I had not read Mansfield Park before uh, I started this project. Uh, I had seen two of the films, the two more recent ones. I haven't seen the old BBC one from like the 80s. Um, so I, get, I knew about what was going on. Um, the first, uh, and I didn't make the script for this one, we were using an, an old script from LibriVox. Um, so the first interaction I had with this text was getting all of the lines from Mrs. Norris, who is the um, obnoxious aunt who is mean to Fanny all the time. Do I need to explain what this book is about? Fanny Price is a like poor girl who goes to live with her rich cousins and um, kind of falls in love with one of them. Slightly awkward first cousin romance for us modern readers to experience. Um, uh, and you know, she feels kind of out of place living with her like rich relations, but not really being one of them and knowing she doesn't have the sort of expectations that her cousins will have. Um, and then throw into this mix um, uh, the two Crawford siblings who arrive in the neighborhood um, who are like not quite as straight-laced and utterly moral as Fanny and her cousin, cousin Edmund are. Um, the, the Crawfords each pursue uh, either Fanny or Edmund um, as uh, gender roles dictate and Fanny is totally not interested but Edmund is kind of interested and so it's all about Fanny proving her like goodness and virtue so that then Edmund will love her and not this like vaguely immoral lady, Mary Crawford. Okay, so the first line, the first experience I had of this book was proof listening to the lines from Mrs. Norris, who is, uh, t she's a terrible person. She's very mean to Fanny. Um, she is um, her aunt, not the aunt that she's living with, but a third sister um, who uh, lives in the neighborhood and comes uh, frequently to Mansfield Park um, to sort of feel like one of the rich Mansfield Park residents, but she really isn't and she's insecure about this and so she deals with this insecurity by being um, cruel to Fanny and like putting her in her place so that she can like distinguish herself relatively to Fanny. Um, so and and the woman who was reading Mrs. Norris when she submitted her line she actually said oh my god God, she was mean. So uh, I experienced Mrs. Norris's lines in all of their glory, and then I went to record my lines, and I was playing Mary Crawford, who is not definitely not the antagonist of this book. She's arguably the antagonist. Mansfield Park, one thing I like about it is that there's a lot more nuance about, like, who is a who's in the right um, than there are in say, um, I don't know, Sense and Sensibility. So I'd just been uh, hearing with my own ears exactly how horrible Mrs. Norris is to Fanny, and um, I knew that um, Marissa from Blatantly Bookish had said that um, when she read Mansfield Park, she sort of felt like um, Mary was only sort of pretending to be friends with Fanny so that she could hang out with and hear about Edmund. Um, and so I was ready for her to be an awful person, and then, like, she wasn't. Um, I feel, I actually think the opposite of Marissa. Um, I feel like Mary Crawford does, is genuinely interested in Fanny and genuinely wants to be her friend. And Fanny is sort of only pretending to like her the whole time, even though she is really unimpressed with her. Um, 
And I do think some of this is the fact that I'm reading it 200 years after it was published. I think history has been kind to Mary Crawford. Um, her initial vice, and the only one that we get an impression of for like the first two thirds of the book, um, is that she thinks members of the clergy are either prudes or hypocrites, which like, yes. So I was pleasantly surprised, and I was like, damn, Mary Crawford, not that bad. Um, and then we sort of start to get later into the book, uh, and she becomes like, I don't know, she's, <laughs> she says some not great things. And I was just like, ooh, Jane Austen, I, um, I have some things to say. Uh, and so by the time we get to the very end, um, proper spoilers here, so if you don't want those, again, skip to this time. Um, when uh, Edmund explains how he went to see, he explains to Fanny how he went to see Mary in London and um, they talked about how their siblings had eloped um, and like Edmund uh, expected her to be like embarrassed or contrite or think this was bad um, and she did not and Edmund was not at all pleased. It is very interesting to me that that scene is in reported speech. You get it all from Edmund's point of view. And while I was proof listening to the Edmund lines, I was like, oh, let me get a word in there. Because here, here is my head canon for how that scene actually went down. I think Edmund is lying to Fanny. I do not think he went uh, to Mary's house and they had a conversation about the elopement which made him decide that he could not marry such a vice-filled woman. Um, I think either he could not pluck up his courage and ask her to marry him and he is just, this is he, him explaining away like, oh no, it's not that I'm a coward, it's that she's awful. Either that happened or he went and he did propose to her and she said no. Um, and so again, he's just lying to save face. Um, I do not think that this is inconsistent with the text, uh, although it does require deeper level of reading. So that was my experience of Mansfield Park. Um, let me know if you think I'm crazy. And then moving on to the next one, uh, Lover's Vows by Elizabeth Inchbald. So uh, this is a play and I had read Elizabeth Inchbald's novel A Simple Story last year and oh my god did I love it. It is so big and stupid and camp. I love camp and I've been reading all of these other 18th century um, novels and I've just been so disappointed because they're really blah and I feel like Elizabeth Inchbald is willing to just go there um, and she totally goes there again with Lover's Vows. It's this ludicrous story. Um, you've got a woman, it's set in Germany because it, this sort of thing could never occur in England um, and also it's based on an original German play. Um, so you've got this woman who like um, was um, like uh, unclear to what extent she was seduced or like genuinely fell in love with but then it just didn't work out. Uh, she was seduced by the lord of the manor. She is a poor girl um, and then she had a child out of wedlock. Um, she has to explain to her now grown-up son that he is illegitimate. Um, Meanwhile, she is like starving to death. Um, so he goes to save her and he will like avenge himself on his father. Um, uh, but first he has to steal money for his uh, mother to eat something with. Um, and he uh, robs the local baron, Baron Wildenheim, who is of course his father. Um, meanwhile, in Baron Wildenheim's house, his daughter, Amelia, is like being courted by this guy, Count Castle. Um, uh, but she is actually nursing a secret passion for her tutor, um, who is, uh, you know, also of a lower class than her. So how's it going to work out? Will it have a happy ending? Obviously it will have a, ha have a happy ending. This is an 18th century play. Um, and it is so over the top. I um, genuinely cracked up when I was reading my lines. I played Amelia because I was, um, who is the daughter who's in love with the tutor. Um, because that's the character that uh, Mary Crawford plays in Mansfield Park. And I, 
I thought it was actually very helpful um, for my Mansfield lines to have already read Lover's Vows. So if you really want to understand Mansfield Park, you got no excuses. You've got to read Lover's Vows. And even if you don't want to understand Mansfield Park, just read Lover's Vows. It is hilarious. Then I read a novel on audiobook and it was by Elizabeth Inchbald again. I cannot get enough of this chick. She is wild. Okay, so this is, I think it was her second novel, Nature and Art. She only wrote two and I can't remember if Simple Story or Nature and Art came first. Oh, another thing I wanted to say back when I was talking about Mansfield Park, but I can slot it right in here, is that um, I think I have read the book in which Mary Crawford and uh, Edmund, uh, what's his last name, Bertram, do get married. And that book is A Simple Story by Elizabeth Inchbald. Um, you've got a, like, I don't know, um, polite way of saying it, vivacious, um, impolite way of saying it, slutty uh, girl um, who falls in love with her guardian who is a Catholic priest and he is like also in love with her but he's like I must reform her and like how is this gonna work and they actually do get married and it actually does not go great. The Simple Story is another thing I would recommend if you want to have a more uh, full appreciation of uh, Mansfield Park and since um, Jane Austen included a play by Elizabeth Inchbald, I think it's reasonable to assume that she may have had some novels by Elizabeth Inchbald on her mind. Anyway, Nature and Art. This book has a very weird structure. So to take Mansfield Park as an example, the first paragraph of the book, or maybe it's two paragraphs, um, tells you the backstory of the previous generation. So, um, you know, we get to hear about the three sisters, one of them marries up, one of them marries at the same social status that they're at, and one of them marries down. Um, and then we move pretty quickly into the lives of their children, who are the actual main characters. The pacing of nature and art, uh, was weird so we spend it's the chapters are very short I was listening to the audiobook and the chapters are frequently um, five minutes or less so um, the main characters of our book we actually don't really meet until like a quarter to a third of the way through and the first section is just all about their dads um, who are brothers and like they're poor and like they're trying to go to university and like survive and one of them becomes a successful violin player and like they have a falling out and like one of them marries down again the other one marries up and it's like awkward and then one of the brothers goes to India uh, sorry not India um like Morocco yeah um some I, I think it's just listed as Africa um and like gets captured by natives and then can't escape and so he's stuck there but like his son manages to go back to England um and so then, like, finally, after all of this wacky shenanigans, um, we get to actually hear about the sons. And then the pacing of this section is quite weird as well. So we have, like, several years where the sons of these two brothers are uh, of a similar age, and they're both, like, maybe 10, 9 or 10 years old. Um, and we get to hear about um, how the one raised in England thinks of things differently than the one who was raised in Africa. Um, and the African one is quite clearly, like, the political voice of the novel. This is a fairly political novel, um, sort of explaining the, like, hypocrisies of the class system and that sort of thing. Um, so, so then we're, like, we have this section about these, like, little boys. And then we have this section about, like, when they're older, um, and they're like romantic entanglements and then like they have sons and it's all the pacing seemed really weird it seemed like either either we should have like stuck with our initial two brothers for like the whole thing um, or or maybe just the first half you could have done like half with the brothers and then half with the sons um, but yeah, I'm j uh, you know what I'm saying. The pacing was weird. Like a 2.75 stars. Um, 
it's not as good as a simple story. I think if you are interested in the Jacobin novel, which is a novel that is sort of meant to explain to English readers the philosophy uh, behind the French Revolution, then it's interesting, but it's not really good as a work of art. And then the last book that I finished uh, was not Georgian. Uh, I moved forward into the Victorian slash Edwardian cusp era, and I read um, Emily Fox Seton by Frances Hodgson Burnett. Um, Frances Hodgson Burnett, most famous for her children's novels such as The Little Princess, Little Lord Fauntleroy, and The Secret Garden, but she did also write for adults. Um, and this book uh, was originally published in two volumes, the first of which was called The Making of a Marchioness, and the second was called The Methods of Lady Walderhurst. They are now generally published together under either the title Emily Fox Seton or the title The Making of a Marchioness. So if you are looking for a copy and you find something called The Making of a Marchioness, make sure it's got both parts to it. Um, or or make sure you can also find a copy of The Methods of Lady Walderhurst. Uh, so this is kind of a Cinderella story. Um, we have like a very nice lady, Emily Fox Eaton. Um, she's kind of poor, she's barely making her way in the world. Um, she is sort of put upon by um, other people who like don't really think much of um, asking her to do all of these fairly arduous tasks. Um, uh, but she does them anyway and like manages to feel bad for the people who are ordering her about um, and then one day uh, the Marquess of Walderhurst uh, comes and marries her and whisks her away um, to his giant house. Um, uh, the interesting thing in this story is that um, Emily is 35 years old which uh, is a little different for a Cinderella type story. Um, and then, so in the second half in The Methods of Lady Walderhurst, we get to know more about um, Lord Walderhurst's cousin and his cousin's wife, who are like the bad guys, because if Lord Walderhurst doesn't have a son, then the cousin will inherit, and so obviously they don't like that there's a marchioness of Walderhurst so much. Um, and also the wife of this cousin is from India, or no, she was, she grew, uh, I think she was born in India and grew up in England, um, but she uh, looks Indian. Um, and so there was definitely some racism going on. The Indian wife is more of a sympathetic character than the English husband, but there's lots of sort of uh, discussion of that kind of person. Um, and overall, I would say this was sort of like nicely written, but it is very conventional. Like at no point did the plot surprise me. It goes on about the way you would expect. Like, um, you know, we spend at least the first third pushing the first half of the book um, with Emily expecting Lord Walterhurst to propose to her friend. Um, and then like, uh, Emily is quite surprised when he proposes to her, but everyone else is like, Emily, you are the main character of this book, obviously it's gonna be you. Um, so I gave this a 3.5 stars. Um, it's nice, but it is by no means required reading. Um, this is also the first book I read by Frances Hodgson Burnett. I have not read any of her children's fiction. Not sure if I'm gonna do that. Um, anyway, I'm almost out of breath. <laughs> It's hard to talk for, what is this, like 20 minutes straight? I don't know how long this was. I'll see you guys later in another video. Oh, I got a phone alert. Yep, that means it's time to go. Bye!